informational webinars or seminars about uh, living in the floodplains in Yardley. Um, the first one dealt with elevated homes. That was, seems like a while ago. The second one dealt with <laughs> real, uh, purchasing and selling uh, real estate in the floodplain. And this one will deal with uh, before and after a flood, preparing for a flood event and safe practices for returning to your property after a flood event. And this evening, besides uh, Caroline Thompson, who's a council member, and is Matt on the call? Okay, no, and um, Paula Johnson, the borough manager is joining us and Wes Foraker, who is the emergency management coordinator and code enforcement officer for Yardley Borough. We also have Dan Moan, a resident and former council member and uh, heavily um, informed on the borough's floodplain ordinances and uh, Don Pomutter, a resident who has unfortunately experienced multiple flooding events mm -hmm. living in the borough and Carl, Carl Perella, who is a contractor and borough resident who has knowledge about construction in the floodplain. And I'm going to share my screen and put the um, agenda up, which has um, Wes's notes on it. So to, um, this evening we're gonna talk about uh, steps you should take or could take um, if you know there's a flood event um, likely to happen. Um, uh, what you might want to do and how to keep your uh, flood insurance up to date, what kind of documentation you might need um, when filing a claim. And we're also going to uh, get input from our residents that have uh, experienced floods and how they prepared for a flood and what they had to do uh, before returning to their homes. And also Carl will speak about uh, construction and uh, steps you might be able to take to mitigate damage uh, to your home in the event of a flood. So those are some of the topics that will be covered this evening. If at any time, I think that if you have questions, um, please raise your hand. If we don't get to them right then, we will certainly have time at the end um, for a question and answer session from residents. This is just like a meeting or and so I think we're going to uh, get started with um, Wes and how to determine what your actual risk is in the event of uh, um, on a coming flood. And Wes, did you want me to share anything? Um, uh, just let me know if you me, when you want me to share the photo that you sent. If you want to throw the first picture up, that'd be great. Too. Sure. Okay. Oh, thanks, okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those who do not know me, I'm Wes Foraker, the uh, emergency okay. management partner. One for you guys, like a travel. Okay. And then, um, Can everyone who's on the line please mute themselves if you're not presenting or speaking? So even presenters who aren't speaking right now, please mute yourself. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Um, not, not only have I been on the borough staff for about 15 years, can can you just unmute yourself, Wes, please? Sorry. Okay, there I am. Hey, okay. um, not only have, have I been on the borough staff for about 15 years, prior to that, I lived in the floodplain. Uh, I was a fourth generation owner of a home uh, that was built by my great grandfather. Um, the house, as well as the neighborhood, obviously went through many floods. Uh, some of the notable ones, 1903, which is known as the Great Pumpkin Flood, due to all the pumpkin farms up and down uh, the river. Uh, 1904, which went up to uh, 30 feet, which uh, crosses the canal onto the, the upper. Uh, the west side of town. Uh, obviously, 1955, where we had uh, hurricanes Diane and Connie uh, colliding in August of, of that year. 1996, which was a good time um, for my family. Um, we had the January ice jam flood, followed by the June of 96 flash flood. And then we had 2004, 2005, and 2006, which most people are uh, pretty familiar with. So we obviously have a, a pretty good history with flooding in um, 
in Yardley Borough. As the picture on the screen shows, flooding is the most common natural disaster in the state of Pennsylvania. Every sector of the country has its um, a demon, for lack of a better term, and ours uh, in the Northeast is flooding. So the first question is, where are you in the floodplain? Uh, Yardley Borough has two neighborhoods in the floodplain. The northern uh, neighborhood is what we call River Mar, and the southern neighborhood would be known as the Flats. The dividing line would be Afton Avenue. And it seems kind of odd, but the north, the south end is actually higher than the north end. You would, you know, you would think it would be the other way around, but it's not. Um, elevations are actually lower on the north end, and that neighborhood does flood first. Uh, so, at what elevation, uh, Kim? Can we go to um, pictures, picture number two, please? The question is, um, at what elevation will you flood? So the best and Fastest way to figure this out is where are you in the floodplain? And it's been made very simple by going to the, the FEMA Flood Map Service Center. Uh, the website for this is msc.fema.gov. And all you have to do, as you can see, is enter your address and hit search. Kim, can we go to picture three, please? And uh, I'm sorry, go back one. Yes. So for this slide, I've used the Burroughs Annex building. That is the red mark there. Um, so we obviously can see that it's in the floodplain. It's, it's right along the floodway. And if this is a screenshot, if had you brought this up, you would see the legend below that. And it would tell you all the uh, intricacies of this, of this map. So it's important to know where you are and what can happen to you in the floodplain. And another way that this has helped is by following the National Weather Service's AHAPS page, which is the Advanced Hydrological Prediction Service. And Kim, could we go to the next slide? Pick four, please. And this will tell you, this is from this morning, um, and you can see where the river was at 8 a.m and where was it predicted to go. And I strongly suggest anybody new to, to living in the floodplain become familiar with this page. It has a lot of tools on it. You can look at our flooding history. There is another page on here for brevity. I, I won't go into all these pages, but you can, you can see where the water would be at different depths. So I think it would behoove everyone to become familiar with this. So potential flood loss. Hey, Wes, real quick, excuse me. Bad job. Um, do we have, an, uh, on the previous uh, map, it, was go, it wasn't based on the Trenton gauge. Uh, I'm looking at, for example, in, uh, or it does, I'm not sure if it does, because I can't really read it, but, um, do these lines that cross over the Delaware River, so at uh, at the um, the annex building, does that show? Th it looks like it shows thirty nine feet, but we're go. But typically, we use the Trenton gauge. Is there any um, correlative, um, you know, relation that if it's this here, it's that on? the Trenton gauge, for example? Uh, actually, th this picture is showing the effects of 39 feet that you would find on the AHAPS page. So you can see where, you know, in, the, in your lighter shade, um, where the river would actually get to if it were to raise to 39 feet. This, you would, I pull, I just did this screenshot off of the Map Service Center this morning, uh, just to show folks how you can find your property. but. If you were to go to the AHAPS page, which was the next slide, and go to the inundation section and plug in 39 feet, this is what it would show. You don't see the inundation section of this page here. I didn't uh, snapshot it, um, but it's, this is something that every homeowner should take the time to go and investigate on their own to become familiar with it, which will lead me to my next um, 
bullet point is how to learn if a flood is imminent. And we have a couple different things we do in the town. Um, number one, it's my job to monitor these things and I, I try to stay on top of it. So when we're aware of something happening and typically river flooding is, is a multi-day event, it'll start a few days ahead and it's dependent on the weather up in the Poconos or into New York State, not necessarily what's happening in Lower Bucks County. So, you know, we pay attention to that, to that weather. Um, it, when something's gonna happen, the borough will send out a mass email. I hope that everybody living in the floodplain has registered with Ready Bucks alerting system, because that is the methodology that myself and Bucks County will use to contact everyone in the floodplain. Uh, becoming familiar with the AHABS page, you can, you can start to track uh, flood depths and predicting uh, the flood occurrences on your own. So it helps to become educated. And you know, all these things come together and it's, it's been a pretty successful methodology for us for the last uh, 15, 20 years. Um, does anybody have any questions? I know I, I went really fast and I, I apologize. No, okay. Uh, Kim, I'm gonna throw it back to you then. Kim, you're on mute. Sorry, I guess today. Um, so Wes, um, based on these maps, a person can um, tell what if, you know, like if the, even if their home is elevated a little bit, they can tell like how much danger their, their home is in if uh, we're expecting a flood event. And um, they can tell where their residence is um, in relation to a particular flood event. Is that, am I understanding that? Yes, um, it's, it's not uncommon for us to have issues in the Rivermore neighborhood, but not in the flats. Uh, using 2011 as an example, um, the prediction, I forget what the prediction was, but it didn't pan out. And we had Pico make safe the electric and the gas for both neighborhoods. But when the event came to fruition, we realized that the prediction went down and we were able to turn the flats back on within a few hours, uh, whereas Rivermar stayed down for a few days. Um, so you know, it really helped. You know, that little bit of elevation makes a difference. Okay, great. Wes, if I could just add to that point, um, <clears throat> if you're new to your neighborhood, because everyone's house is really at a different level. I mean, obviously Rivermar is lower than we are over here in the flats. But if you have a neighbor um, and you're new and haven't been through the process or through a flood, um, you might want to knock on their door or stop and chat with them for a few minutes to pick their brain as far as your property and their property and at what level um, the river flooding, you know, approaches your home. I know um, on my street, um, you know, I, I have a good idea of the houses around me and the feet and, and what kind of damage gets caused by certain uh, levels of the river. So you should avail yourself of neighbors who have lived through it to, uh, to get a feel for that. Very good point, Dan, thank you. If I can tack on for just a second, also when you talk with your neighbors, find out the best way to get out of your neighborhood in the case of a high water event. That sounds like uh, good advice and something people should put in their uh, their flood plans, just like a, a fire plan. Um, okay, so uh, next we're going to have uh, Dan Moan um, talk about uh, how often people need to update their flood insurance policies, what kind of documents you might need to have. Um, it's one thing, I think, just to have an insurance policy. It's another thing to know how it works when you actually need it. So maybe we could cover some of that. Sure, no problem. Um, <clears throat> so your, your flood insurance policy, you can get uh, your policy one of two ways. You can either get it through FEMA um, or you can get it through a private insurer. Um, it used to be that they weren't really available in the private market, um, though that has changed more uh, recently. 
Um, and I'll talk mostly about the FEMA insurance. Um, I just note that you can get private insurance. Um, and I believe there are some local, if you call a local insurance person, most of them are familiar since they live in the area with, uh, with flood insurance policies. Um, so from an insurance perspective, you can only get so much coverage from FEMA. Um, I don't remember the exact amount, but it's around two hundred and fifty to $300,000 is the maximum that you can get um, for coverage on your house. Um, in addition, you can get coverage for stuff that's in your house. Um, and that's primarily uh, first floor damage, not to be confused with basement damage. Uh, because if you live in the floodplain and you have um, a below ground floor, such as a basement, um, flood insurance will not cover anything that's in that uh, part of your house as far as possessions go. Um, so your FEMA rates are based upon um, how much coverage you take. And I'll just give you an example of the strategy that, that I've used. Um, because the rates have gone up significantly in the last few years, as I've been paying down my mortgage, I've been balancing you know, the amount of coverage I have with what I have left on my house versus you know, what the potential um, damages that I could you know, suffer in a, in a flood. Um, and just based on experience, I know that you know, at, at 25 feet, I got four feet in my basement. I got no first floor damage. So I'm uh, more apt to reduce my coverage for, um, in order to save money. Whereas someone who right, maybe is in Rivermar doesn't want to take, you know, doesn't want to do a, a reduction like I did based upon what's left on your mortgage. Um, as far as uh, what's covered after the fact, um, nothing in your basement though. Um, I, if you had um, laundry stuff in your basement um, or food in your basement, you can get reimbursed for, for those minor items, but nothing major. If you're storing clothes or stuff downstairs, um, it, it's not, uh, it cannot be, uh, a claim cannot be put in against it. Um, those rates uh, for your insurance are set in essence by Congress. Um, and there's always a push and pull every year or every couple of years with um, people who on one side say that the program should be self-sufficient and they're normally looking to raise the insurance rates uh, versus um, others who are looking to kind of spread those costs across all taxpayers. Um, recently, the, the rates, the reason that uh, I, I've at least personally focused on this is because the rates have gone up substantially. Uh, even for those of us who aren't repetitive loss, meaning we haven't put in claims um, during the floods because we didn't have anything to cover, our rates are still uh, going up. I can only imagine what the rates of uh, those in the repetitive loss who haven't elevated are. They've got to be out of this world. Um, so that's kind of my overview. Are there any specific questions on insurance that anyone might have? I was just wondering how detailed of documents people need to have. Like, do you need to have photographs and receipts and, you know, what do you, I don't, I, I mean, having never filed a homeowner's claim, thank goodness, I, I have no idea about whether it's for a flood or, or any other claim. Yeah, I mean. I mean, um, pictures are going to be most of your thing. I mean, <clears throat> after, uh, you know, the, the two main floods we had back in the middle 2000s, all the damage was out in everyone's front yard, right? Because they pulled all the stuff out of their house and they kind of laid it. Um, and there's also a phenomenon that happens. Uh, they're called insurance adjusters. And they uh, descend upon our communities uh, in the aftermath Um to, for lack of a better term, assist in the process, though um, you have to be careful which ones that you do associate with and, and use. 
um, which is a whole, a whole different thing. But you don't need to use insurance adjusters. You can do it on your own. Um, I'm just trying to remember back specifically. Um, I believe there were forms we had to declare. Um, we took pictures um, and we put our claims in and you know, it took, I don't remember, six months, but I know, but we had no damage. Like we had damage the first time, but nothing like, you know, River Mar where you have the first floor damage. I don't know, Chuck, did you have first floor damage back, uh, back in the day? Oh yeah, um, uh, as far as the 2004 flood was concerned, uh, we had 18 inches of water on the first floor. Um, the 05 and 06, the water was between the countertops and the electrical outlets in the kitchen, um, almost three and a half feet. Um, and uh, as a side note, uh, we, the first time, did use an adjuster, and uh, it worked out very well. One point of note, though, is the minute that you say you want to use an adjuster, the insurance company will basically shut you off, and it's kind of like, you know, needing to use a lawyer, and the adjuster and their appraiser will work together to come up with the specific numbers and things like that. Um, I, I thought it was a good thing for me for the, for the 04 one. Um, uh, and then, you know, we sort of knew the, we knew the game already because there's a, you know, when you, when you're first going through this, there's a lot of things that you don't know, uh, and don't know how to claim. Uh, one of the things that I, I've recommended to a number of people is if you know that there is going to be a significant high water event coming in and you know that it's going to affect, for example, your first floor, walk through your house with a vi and take videos of everything so they can see exactly what is going on. Because when you have to file your claims, they have to know basically what the items are, when you purchase them, you may not necessarily need a, uh, a sales receipt or anything like that, but you, they do have, in some cases, um, you know, um, valuation issues, uh, you know, where there might be a depreciation factor to come into play. And frankly, when, you know, after everything is hit, the water's gone back down, um, when you're dealing with a whole bunch of silt-filled belongings, you're not necessarily going to remember exactly all of the things that you have gotten. Uh, and that can be real important. I know that there were people um, literally that, you know, didn't realize six months later, oh, these things were done or that was done and things like that. Uh, so that can be a, a really important thing. Also something to take in consideration is that if you're going to try to mitigate and take and take belongings that are going to be up above where the projected water line is. Don't use something like a couch where water will seep and, and uh, basically soak through and potentially damage those things that you think that you're protecting because they're up on top of the couch. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I think that uh, if we were to ever have such an event you know, happen, um, you'd be a valuable resource and those who kind of gone through some of the more comprehensive claims um, processes, right? There's, there's some knowledge there that you have that uh, could be useful. And there was a question asked by uh, the McGraths about uh, what the fees are for the adjuster and Wes had answered that they work off a percentage. Um, so I just wanted to note that for those who did not see that. Any additional questions on insurance? Not about insurance, but uh, well, actually, there was one thing, and I don't know if it applies um, for sure, but you had mentioned about, for example, laundry items and food items that can uh, be covered. Uh, one thing I was surprised of, and I think this, it, the policy is still the same, is, for example, you are also covered for things for the upkeep of your house. What I mean by that is if you um, had your work tools um, on, say, the first floor, 
uh, those are not covered. However, if your lawnmower is on the first floor, that's used to keep her, to cover the the cutting of your lawn, which is the upkeep of your house, and the lawnmower would be covered. So there's a, a fine line to take in consideration of what you might want to keep and what you might not want to keep. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think that um, right now we should maybe uh, skip over the the resident uh, presentation about um, uh, creating a flood plan and maybe move on to Carl and have him address uh, steps to mitigate uh, any potential flood damage. And uh, so you maybe will not need the claims adjuster. <laughs> okay, so I wrote down some notes here. So judging by my experience with the, um, with the floods, and I think one of the best things you can do is if, if you have the time or you have the computer that can do it, make it a first floor plan, length and width of each room. Um, if you can put down what, what molding is on your baseboard, what kind of flooring you have, uh, what kind of wall material you have, because this is all um, relative and pertinent to what the insurance adjuster is going to pay your claim. And same with your basement. If he's just doing cleanup, what do you have in that basement? How big is the basement? Um, how many square feet is it? And, and stuff like that. Now, as far as that'll help you through the recovery of loss, us funds for losses. But as far as um, ways to minimize your damage, if there's any way you can do it, it's not easy to get your heater or your um, <clears throat> electrical panel out of the basement. This is a lot of work trying to get all those wires that are feet fed into it up and onto a um, safe spot on the first floor. Dan, we did this to your house years ago. I don't know if you remember that. Or you did it to your house years ago. Yeah, um, I do. We, uh, it was in the basement. So it's basically now in the dining room and I had my, I bought a big canvas and had my uh, daughter paint a picture which hangs over my uh, electrical panel, which is now on my first floor, but it will not get wet again. So that's the good part. Okay, so those are some of the things. Um, just don't have anything that uh, you don't mind parting with because if it's not like a lawn, uh, washing machine and a dryer, you're just not gonna get paid for it. So if you can even get your hot water heater up and out, um, if you have gas, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if they make electric on-demand water heaters that they fit onto the first floor instead of the big uh, tank kinds. That's a tankless water heater. So that's something you could look at. Um, but mostly that heater uh, and HVAC, HVAC stuff. And um, as far as should I waterproof my basement? Okay, so when I had my basement fill up with water a couple of times, I, I got funds to parge the inside because we have an old stone um, foundation and I got funds for parging uh, the interior, which I did not do. Um, I used those funds to get my heater out of the out of harm's way. <clears throat> um, so that's one thing. Should you fill it in the basement or fill it, fill it into crawl space? I really don't know. I that's a that's a good I've thought about that myself I, I really don't know if i would do that carl is your basement finished oh no it's like it's yeah. it, it's a glorif it's very short glorified crawl space it's it's um completely empty yeah. and i do have some crawl space so no i, I would never keep anything down there mm -hmm. at all i mean it's i wouldn't i don't know if you want to fill stuff in i mean i have a basement like a full-size basement it's just not finished and it's, it's a glorified, uh, it's like my attic. I don't have an attic, right? So I store my stuff down there. And then, you know, every uh, couple of years, we get a flood scare and I bring it all up. And then I'm like, I'm not carrying all this stuff back down. And, and then uh, it, it gets kind of weeded out on its own. Um, but I don't think there's really a need to, I mean, if there's nothing in there when it floods, it's not going to damage anything. I, I don't know why you would need to fill it in. When I lived in, in Rivermar, I, the last few years that I was there, I moved my heater 
out of the basement. I actually built a room on the back of the house with the heater, and it was it was about four or five feet higher than um, it had been. And I only kept things I could easily move out of the basement down there. And if they got wet, like you know, a, a box of wrenches, didn't matter if it got wet. I, I could I could be easily moving. Um, but the important thing was the windows in the basement because they worked as flood vents. So I would not be in a hurry to fill in a basement, especially if you have windows, because they will work as a flood vent and let waters uh, proceed through the structure and minimize the structural damage. Now, you might lose some mortar between the, the stone, but most of these old houses, those are stone basements. Uh, they're, they're not poor, most of them. Um, so it, it, it's fixable, but it, it's better to have you know, the water go through the structure than have the structure take the beating of the pressure of the water. So that's a good point. So um, there are people who remain during the flood to continuously pump their basement out to keep it from rising up so high that it would get to the first floor. Um, I don't know if that's a 50-50 that's a chance because if you don't equalize the pressure in the basement, you could get a cave-in. And I've seen a couple cave-ins in, in my neighborhood where the foundation wall blew out. <clears throat> and then that's a real mess to put back together. I don't, I don't know about the um, landscaping. Okay. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. So that's all common sense stuff. And the same with, um, um, will mitigation measures be considered substantial improvement to the home? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, if you were- Yeah, yeah Carl, possibly for the substantial improvement, I mean, that's the 50% rule, right? Mm -hmm. If you're making changes to your house, as long as you're not going over the 50% value of your home, uh, which is a whole new lesson of itself. But uh, so it'd have to be pretty major. Um, you're talking, you know, you'd have to be doing $100,000 worth of work in order for it to start um, flirting with the substantial improvement numbers. So what are dry proofing measures and what are wet flood proofing measures? Um, that parging I talked about around the inside of a stone foundation. I think that'll help hold it together if the floods are recurring. And um, I think the most important thing is to recapping on everything so far is to make the document of everything you have uh, in the on the first floor if you're vulnerable to first floor flooding. Same with the basement on how much time it's gonna to take to clean that up. Um, by the time you hire somebody, now some of these serb pro companies come in and they just they just build the insurance company and you don't have to worry about um, anything. I, if you do it yourself, they may not pay you for it as much as they pay the the company. So that's what you need to find out what those what the value of those things are um, as you go along. Uh, I Carl, just real quickly. Uh, Dry flood proofing refers to uh, creating barriers. Uh, if anybody saw it a few years ago, the Yardley Inn had a, a barrier system that went around the building. That would be an example of dry flood proofing. Uh, wet flood proofing would be uh, flood vents and those types of things, parging of the, the masonry, installing flood vents, that kind of thing. That's the difference between dry, dry and wet flood proofing. If I can add a couple of quick things too, if you're uh, considering to do things like elevating your electrical panel, um, it might be a good idea to actually consider not only to uh, elevate it, but also um, having a means to incorporate a backup generator if necessary. Because if you do get to the point where your uh, house has been inundated by water, there, uh, you may not have electricity for a while. Uh, I know that when one of the first things we did was elevate our uh, electric panel. And then when I put in the second phase for the house after elevating, um, I actually took a sub panel and created it as my transfer switch. So I can plug in and be running uh, without having to worry about um, any outside street power and not having it. 
Uh, that can be a, a very important thing because especially when we had the 1996 um, high water event with the ice blocks that were a foot and a half thick hitting our house and things like that, um, we were able to get the house back in operation. And if it's in uh, sensitive weather times, um, this could be the difference between frozen pipes and not, which would obviously require more damage as we saw in the Texas situations uh, most recently and things like that. Um, Nico, put your meter back on right away until you, until you make certain repairs and so forth. Right, but, but it, so if, you're, if your electric panel is up above, um, you could actually get in operation a lot faster. Uh, as far as gas is concerned for PICO, I am probably the only one in Bucks County that has a snorkel on my uh, on my gas meter that Pico came out to approve. Um, that's another option. So we can once everything gets going, we can get back in operation regardless if if we had three feet had it go under uh, you know three feet underwater or something like that. So it, sometimes if you're going to if you are potential to get in a situation where you're a, a concerned about your water or your gas or your electric, um, think about expanding ahead and, and doing something like a transfer switch or something like that. Thank you. Um, one, Carl, one, or I think it was you or Wes the other evening that mentioned about bolting your oil tank down. Right. Yes. Okay. So I, I think I mentioned mine was um, floating in one of the floods and right. one of my neighbors uh, directly behind me, they did have an oil tank tip over and they had special, I don't know how much oil spilled, but they had special company come in and special dumpsters and it took a long time and you, you don't want that odor in your house. No. You don't want that. I'm sure some is floating around in floodwaters anyway, but they should, there should be a, an ordinance. They have to be bolted down inside or out. Thank you. Okay. Um, and before we move on to, oh. to does somebody have a question? Nope. We, One we... comment though, um, if you if you plan on, if there is a potential for a, a high water event that will impact your uh, oil tank for going underwater, it's better to have it filled up with oil as opposed to have it displace water into it. Um, we had a neighbor uh, during the 96 high, uh, winter event that actually uh, had a semi filled, oil tank and water got in and we had red snow all over the neighborhood for a long time. The only thing that really saved us was that we had that rain for so much time to be able to flush it out. Thank, thank you. Um, so uh, both Dan- Kim, can, I, can I jump in real quick? So I'm sorry, my husband's using power tools in the basement. If it's <laughs> noisy, I apologize. Um, so there was a bullet point in, in the um, outline about uh, rain gardens or uh, landscaping. And I know Carl didn't touch on that, but it is something that I'm seeing become common in the flats, especially for the homes that back to the canal. So a rain garden can help your uh, backyard to drain th water 30% more quickly. So it's not gonna help you dur during a high water event, but certainly with the constant rain we've been having recently, um, it will be helpful. So I'm posting a resource in the chat and then I'll mute myself again. Thank you. That was fine. Um, actually, that is a good point for um, um, a lot of yards, even like my dad, who is not in a flood zone, had to build drainage into his yard because you never know what kind of run runoff you're going to get from other people's homes, ruining your lovely landscaping. Um, so Dan uh, touched on having what kind of documents you needed to have prepared or possibly have prepared uh, before a flooding event happens. And uh, Carl also touched on knowing, you know, the, the measurements of your first floor and the construction materials used. So, um, so Dan and Dawn, um, if a family is to create a flood plan, you know, and so they are ready and in, uh, in the event where they're going to experience a flood event, what should be included in a flood plan? Like, um, how do you determine where your pets are going to go or where, where you're going to go or where you're going to put your car and things like that what is included in a flood plan for a for a resident um well 
I can tell you most of the people in the neighborhood drive their cars up to Main Street and park on high ground. Um, and that created problems on Main Street. Um, I, it, during, I get them all mixed up. I went through four of them, but I didn't get out soon enough on one and the water was completely surrounding and I had my dogs and literally um, you do, we do have rescue. There are people who come out on boats and rescue you, but they'll only do that to a point where it's safe for them. So I think one of my, one of my neighbors came with their boat and, and got us out and we were going through the Mary Yardley bridge um, that um, are, are literally your boat was going through the Yardley and parking lot and, until you got to high enough ground. Um, wow. Uh, it, it's hard to plan um, for pets, you know, it's just, you just have to have, uh, there, luckily now there's pet hotels, they didn't have them as much back then. So is it like creating a fire plan? Do people actually have flood plans or do you just kind of wing it when it happens? Like, oh, I better move my stuff. Yeah, I mean, um, I I've never seen a resident with an official flood plan, but we all pretty much know, have at least given it some thought and know what it is that we're going to do um, should that happen. Uh, for example, you know, the major things are getting your vehicle out. Um, and, yeah. you know, I think we parked our vehicles at the train station um, when, when it happened a couple times. Um, and then there is where am I going to stay? Right. Um, I happen to have family within an hour. Um, so <clears throat> it was realistic to not have to get a hotel room, which is what some people need to do. Some people will need to get a hotel room, um, but they're going to have to travel to get that too because they fill up pretty quick when, uh, when everyone's got the same idea going. Um, the other, as far as pets go, same thing. Um, I didn't really have to worry about since I had family close, we could take the pets with us. Um, but I think we actually did not take the pets with us. We put them on the second floor um, because we're, you know, our first floor is not generally going to get water. So it's pretty safe to put the pets. We just moved all their stuff upstairs while we were gone. And we don't have any dogs, so they're cats. So, you know, they can take care of themselves for a couple of days. They're um, fine. We haven't been flooded with the chickens yet, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do with the chickens. Um, I wondered that. But I think they're they'll pretty, pretty much where they are is pretty much dry, uh, relatively speaking. So they'll, they'll survive. Um, and then, um, so those are the major things. And then the plan of once they let you back in, right? What's the plan with getting your stuff back online if you don't have this? the skills to fix things, you know, where you're going to get a contractor, but you're thinking about all these things while you're, you know, sitting around at your parents' house waiting for the flood waters to recede back. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, <clears throat> it's definitely something that you need to think about because if not, you're going to learn the first time mm -hmm. um, sure. the flaws and in, in not thinking about it. If you are receiving the ready bucks alert notifications if you've signed up to receive the, the notification from your borough you should have gotten one christmas weekend that i sent out and it's something we'll always do uh, ahead of a high water event uh, if you recall christmas weekend the river didn't come up fortunately it didn't it only went to, to about 19 feet i believe which was just on the road uh, i'm sorry no it was, it was around 18 feet um but in that alert that i sent out one of the first things in there move one of your cars up above the canal. That's always going to be one of the first tips we're going to tell you to do. You can leave the second one because you're going to need to get out later, but if you have two cars, get one out now. Um, back in 2006, 2007, myself and uh, Bill Winslade, who was the manager of the borough at the time, we put our heads together and we came up with what we felt was a, a pretty good uh, guide for people in Yardley who live along the river in, in the floodplain. And you can find that handbook that we put together on the borough website. And it, it gives you some tips on what things you might need if when you're, when you're evacuating. You want some cash, you want your medicines, 
you want your phone chargers, you want phone numbers. You know, most of us don't remember phone numbers anymore because these little handheld things hold them for us. You know, 30 years ago, we had to remember all these numbers or write them down. Now we don't. So you, you want to have ways of getting in contact with people. But that little handbook is, is on the Bro website and it'll give you some ideas. Um, once you go through it, you, you, you'll learn really fast what you, you need. So it's better to think ahead of time than to rely on your hopefully quick wits. So one of the floods, I don't know, I forget which one it was. Um, honestly, there's been so many, but it came up a lot faster than they predicted. And I think so all these, all these measures that you can get together ahead of time will help because the flood can come faster than they predict. I think even a um, Fitzgerald's funeral home had a problem getting somebody out of there. It came up so quickly. Yes. That, that... You know what I mean? Um, and there was something else on the, um, how do you start your flood claim? Start your flood claim, have that numbers ready, that policy number ready to call that in immediately. And if you can get a contractor out there to help you with that, that floor plan, um, as soon as you can re-enter and speaking of re-enter, you, you want that power on or else it's going to be a cold night, a dark night in the house. And even though that water can, like Wes said, recede quickly. And maybe you don't have much damage to your home. The power is not going to come on instantly. They're going to come around and reset meters. And uh, it takes a little while to um, get the gas turned back on. Lots of That's plastic good. tubs. Lots of pla big plastic tubs. Because things that you put in there will float. They, they'll preserve it. Um, you know, the, the kind they sell at like Lowe's or Home Depot, they're just keep 10 of them because you won't have time to get everything out and anything you, you can't get out. They, they really, I remember they floated and everything inside was still dry. That's good to know. And I think that, I think the first purchase you want to make um, if you live in the floodplain, if you don't have one already, is a generator. Um, mm -hmm because when the flood comes, the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna turn our power off before the water gets here to prevent uh, damage to the electrical infrastructure. And then they're not gonna turn it back on until they come out and inspect your home and make sure that it's safe to turn that power back on. And that, that process isn't ours. That process is many, many, many days. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time there's a flood, all the generators at Home Depot and Lowe's within seven hours of our of our houses are gone. So, you know, if, if you're thinking about flood stuff, you know, moving up the panel, you know, all those things are great. Number one is I think get yourself a generator. To tag on to Dan's comments, uh, Carl and I were speaking the other night about uh, restoring electrical. And when I lived in Rivermar, uh, I was very fortunate. One of my neighbors was a, an electrician and we were pretty good friends. Um, we actually popped all the breakers out of my panel and after the flood receded, wiped down the panel, popped the breakers in, replaced all the devices, the outlets that were underwater and I have my power back on pretty quick. Um, now, uh, after talking with Carl the other night, I just did some research and that's no longer going to be the case. They now consider wiring that has been underwater to be uh, something that needs to be replaced, which is now jacked up the time that it's going to take for you to get back uh, into normal living when you have to replace all your wiring. That's not something the average homeowner is going to do now. Now you have to bring in a contractor. I can replace outlets. I'm not going to rewire the first floor of my house. It's beyond my abilities. So I'd, I'd like to also uh, circle back real quickly to pets. Um, 20 years ago, most people just had dogs and cats. Now we're seeing goats and chickens and lizards and llamas and everything. And there are organizations that I can uh, go to for animal rescue in the event that that's necessary. But assuming that everybody is a good pet parent, um, you're taking your pets to the veterinarian. So if you have a non-traditional pet, 
chickens, goats, whatever, speak to your veterinarian about what you would need to do to board to this, this animal if you have to evacuate your property. They can direct you. Uh, dogs and cats, you're, you're, you're pretty safe with that. You know, you may not get them into all the hotels, you'll probably get them into one or two or a family or a friend. Um, but the, the non-traditionals, um, that's going to be interesting. You know, we didn't have chickens in the floodplain 20 years ago. Actually, we did, but they floated yeah. in. Um, that's a whole other story. I'm releasing them on Main Street, Wes. <laughs> I, I, I buy farm fresh eggs. So if you pay me five dollars a week, Dan, I'll take it. <laughs> Tommy Green's chickens actually uh, ended up roosting on his garage roof uh, during the flood of '96. I do recall the roosters that floated in, and it's true they do cackle at the crack of dawn. Yeah. Um, if I can add something about the electrical, uh, as a member of the Electrical Inspectors Association, um, one of the thing, if you are in a floodplain, uh, a flood-prone house, um, there are what you have to, what the electric company is in, uh, concerned about is what they call Romex wire, which is residential wire. It's typically either yellow or white or orange color. Um, but if you have to have wiring replaced, you can always have what they call UF rated, which is underwater feed rated. Uh, it's used for outside in place of uh, the Romex. The problem with the Romex is that while it has the waterproof conductors in it, there is a paper insulator that will wick. And that's where the problem is because the, the, the water cannot come out of that wire. But um, all houses that have been elevated, all ground floor receptacles, switches and everything else are the UF rated wire, um, which is a little bit more expensive, but then all you would have to do is replace the uh, receptacles or the switches associated with those particular legs. The other thing is, if you, um, any, anything on the ground floor or that is prone to water should have a GFCI circuit breaker and not GFCI receptacle. Um, that will then trigger and shut off the circuit going from the circuit breaker panel to the ground as opposed to at the outlet itself. Um, there have been a num number of times in the past where um, the house may not have been de-energized and uh, there was still live electricity in the water, which is an extremely dangerous situation. Th thank you, Mr. Dolan. Um, um, the first few pictures that I've shown so far were provided by um, Ms. Perlmutter, so I'd like her to speak to that and then also any uh, question and answers or questions that anybody may have um, could possibly be answered at this mm -hmm. time. So okay. Do you want me? I just want to go through it very quickly. So it's just right. going to be boom, boom, boom. Um, it basically was an aerial view to show um, how substantial this was. And I don't even remember which flood was which. Um, you can go to the next one. These, this is um, the funeral home. And again, these pictures were taken after it's already subsided because you can't really be there next. to take them when it's at its worst. Um, next. Um, I'll go up. I think you're just, you're, oh, you're I'm just making it bigger and bigger. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> can, you <go laughs> back, you, yeah. <laughs> can you go back to the regular size? Just you know, <laughs> reduce it a little bit to the regular size. Um, um yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant. Um, brilliant. Yeah. This, um, is, uh, Brown street and, um, Wes's house is one of those, um, Wes lived three doors north of me on Brown. Chuck lived three doors north of me on North Delaware. And again, this is after it's subsided. Um, next. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and this is what happens when you don't get your car out of there and they're done. You, know, you can never really fix it. Next. Because um, I have so many slides. Okay. Uh, yeah, next. I think that's Morgan Avenue. Um, oh, it's yep. still big. Um, I think if you reduce it. Oh, really? I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so again, I went through 96, the floods we just mentioned. 
that was my house um, before it was raised. And um, uh, you can see on the next slide that um, it was right on the other side of the creek from the Yardley Inn. So it uh, eventually in some of these floods, the river, Brock Creek and the canal all met. And literally that house was like being in the middle of the river, which had been going very fast, a certain amount of knots. Um, next, I wanna just go through it quickly. All right, that's fine, I guess. Um, again, another view. Now, I, I, this is previous books, they're not 20 years old. Um, this, is what <laughs> this is what happens to your beautiful gardens. So I had to run out and get all those pots out of there. I can't tell you, all you know is mud, mud, mud. And everything that you don't get out of there washes away, gets smashed up. Um, again, I had a fish pond. Talk about pets. I forgot my koi. And then when I went to replace them, they had been, I had them for years and they were so big. It was like thousands of dollars. So I didn't get any more fish. Again, next, um, this is what happens when it goes underwater. And again, this is not at its peak. This is um, next. Um, and this is North Delaware Avenue. It was rushing very fast. You get the um, current starts coming around your house too. Um, next. Um, so basically you never think it's gonna happen to you. I certainly never did. And he certainly never thinks it's gonna happen to you three times. I waited too long to leave. I, um, I learned that the hard way take your valuables with you. It's just like a fire. You can't think of everything. You just start going crazy. You can't think of everything. So you really need to have, have it packed like a go bag. Um, next, um, depending on how severe the threat, by the time we got to the third flood, neighbors were renting trucks and just moving everything out. Literally their appliances, literally packing their whole house because it was just so much trouble to replace everything. Um, and appliances get contaminated with raw, raw sewage and oil. They can't be used again. Um, next. Um, again, um, this is what everything looks like. Your whole life is on your lawn. Um, next. The one thing I do remember is you know, these TVs were like a really big deal back then. Every man that saw this TV gasped. It was like, it was like the worst thing that could have ever happened. Um, next. Next, you can just keep clicking. Just different. Oh, now this is, um, if you go back, that was Brock Creek. Um, this is just through my front window. The river is now surrounding the house. Actually, the 2005 took my house off its foundation. And that's the one I should have gotten out of sooner. Um, next. I shouldn't have been in there taking pictures of this. That was dangerous. Um, next, and again, you can see the stop sign, but there were currents. It was a really fast river. Next. Wow. Yeah, you can just keep clicking. Just different pictures. Uh, the pond again. And you're just left with not just your debris, everybody's debris. I had just built this deck at Wash. That's Brock Creek that had hit my house before the river did. The Yardley Inn on the other side. Next. Um, next. Just to give you an idea of how overwhelming it is. Fences, no matter, even when they're open, they come down. This was, if you click again, this was how high the water was. That's a, somebody's picnic table and chair hanging off the bridge. Um, the flash flood, things were just smashing. A car smashed into this bridge. It was unbelievable with the flash flood, very dangerous. Um, you can just keep clicking. Oops. That that was somebody else's boat that ended up, I think I ended up giving that to people in the neighborhood. Came from up river, so uh, that a, a, the deck and a boat. You have to get your docks in. You cannot leave your docks out. Don't walk your dogs in the flood area for months afterwards. Everybody's dogs had bacterial infections because it just gets in. There's so much stuff in the water. Um, again, my the first one, the oil tank did let loose in my basement with 170 gallons of oil. 
It was a hazmat cleanup. It was horrendous. It was horrendous. Um, fences wash away, um, gas cans wash away. Again, like everybody said, your mechanicals get up. Um, next. Oops, sorry. That's okay. Um, next. You just have mud everywhere. See, that was a fence that was around the whole property. The current was so strong, it pulled it completely out of the ground. And trees, some, I had a tree in my garage at one point too. Giant trees can come and hit your house too. So, um, and this was the neighbor's fence. Next. That sucks. When my, they had to get my ancient um, heater out of there. I guess it, it was like something that belonged in the Smithsonian and weighed a gazillion tons. Um, next. Back then, everybody helped everybody. That's a, young, a younger version <laughs> of everybody. Um, but the first flood, everybody's wonderful. By the time you get to the fourth, you know, you, you don't have anybody left. Friends, friends don't come over to shovel mud anymore. Next. Um, then the house elevation. Um, early on, um, we didn't know what we were doing. The first couple people, we just figured it out. Um, when the high flash water event occurred, hang on, how much of warning? The, the warning we had was what happened was the Delaware water gap opened up its reservoir on us and was coming down the, the river. And even though I had carried everything upstairs, we only had about two, an hour and a half but people were wonderful. There was a whole soccer team that came and carried things up. Um, it depends on the flood. Um, other options, I just um, uh, mentioned this before. Um, when we first did it, they had a program where you could be reimbursed. Um, I think Sue Mazzatelli was talking about that again, that they're starting to, they have that program. It's going, it's up to 30,000 now. I think it was 15,000 at the time. Um, and it, if you're thinking of renovating, it's certainly worth, you can do it in, just get contractors who have experience in raising the house. Um, so it can be done um, during a renovation. You still have to follow all the regulations, but you don't have to wait to get on the list. And then Wolf the, um, was who everybody used at that time. You can click, um, they had all kinds of gadgets and they have to first take your house off its foundation. Um, this is my favorite slide because of the little boy that was standing there. So this giant, these beams are brought in to lift your house. That was my beautiful garden um, with the tractors going through it. Um, that I think was, was very traumatic. Um, again, that was the garden before and during construction. Um, and they're experts. I mean, they, and this was not a typical house with that roof. It was like a 200 ton house with very, very, a lot of problems, but this is how it looks when they do it. Um, then they bring in what I call the Jenga wood pieces. Um, let's see, Chuck's telling me, make sure you have enough fuel to run at least two days of fuel. Absolutely. Chuck is an expert at this. Um, yeah. I'm, I, if you folks uh, check on the, the chat box, I was re, um, replying to somebody asking about generators. I'll put some more information in that should be helpful. I've done quite a, a couple of these already and uh, uh, proved to, to be very, very helpful. Yeah, it, it, there were a number of issues, issues, but this was an unusual house. Then I had to go up higher because things were different. Um, and, uh, it was just, uh, and, and a huge, these were the architectural drawings. This is what it was supposed to look like when it was done. Um, we, it never got that far. And honestly, by the fourth flood, it, we had the 2006 flood when that had just been up in the air. And um, I ended up, I do still live in Yardley, but I ended up moving to a hill because <laughs> It was just, I, I don't know, I think Chuck's the only one that still stayed. Um, he's, he's the survivor, um, but you get worn down um, after the process, uh, but you certainly learn a lot. And, um, and uh, it, it was uh, just a number of um, 
it, you just learn a lot of different things. I did use the public adjuster um, on one of the times and that was really good. They take a large percentage though, but sometimes you just don't have the energy and, and they really know what to do. And, and there's definitely fly-by-night contractors that come through because you have to understand that everybody's been flooded all up and down the whole Delaware. So there's no contractors to be found. And then you get fly-by-night people, you're, you're like desperate to have anybody. So that's when um, the borough and Wes had instituted um, a, a wristband and we had to actually um, have it where people couldn't go in the neighborhood. Um, it's just very, when you have that kind of devastation, I mean, New Hope was gone, the other side of the river. Um, so the, it, the oddest thing was you would come up to Main Street and everything was like normal. <laughs> but um, the church's help, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, they got everybody hotel rooms, they fed us so we couldn't eat anymore and they brought bleach gallons and gallons of bleach um because you have to really bleach everything so thank you thank you for sharing sharing all those um photographs that was a uh, quite um a learning experience well we don't we've already gone over but i want to give an opportunity um i do see that people have been um using the chat and getting their questions answered um this meeting has is being recorded and um is that going to be, how do people access that, Paula? It'll be on the website and on our YouTube as well. Okay, thank you. And then, but does anybody have any questions they would like answered now? And if um, we do run out of time, I'm sure that um, you can email them to us and then we can get them answered for you. I don't have a question, but I'd like to um, actually uh, address something that Don had mentioned. Uh, we have really, uh, as a community, been blessed, uh, and I truly say that, with the outpouring of support of people when they realize or know that um, there are going to be a high water situation. I'm sorry, I still like to say high water. I don't like to use the <laughs> F word, okay? Uh, but, but ultimately, we've had um, groups... Um, with literally over a hundred people come down to our area. And instead of using ripoffs like ServPro, and I will say that oh, uh, specifically because during the 04 high water event, um, I had ServPro come in here and not only did, were they only going to do from where the watermark was to the floor, um, which is by the way now, uh, been updated for the insurance purposes that if you have water um, due to a high water event that is on your walls, you now cut from four feet to the floor instead of where the water line was because they un insurance companies understand that uh, if you have fiberglass insulation, it is now wicked up into the wall. Yeah. And it's much more cost effective for uh, an installer to come in and put in sheetrock that's usually typically four foot wide by either eight or 10 feet horizontally instead of having to cut the, the sheetrock and taking extra time to do the installation. Um, so things like that are really important, but um, you know, all the church groups, the Knights of Columbus, the, uh, the, the American Red Cross, I know that um, it, it got to a point where Saint, people were from St. Ignatius were coming down and they'd go to, you know, the, the, uh, um, the, the border zone where the people were being uh, turned away and they'd say, we're going to Dolan's and they just literally let, let them all in. And when it, they, people literally would go, started at our house, they'd rip from four to the floor, uh, other groups of people would be throwing straw, not hay, down on the, gra on the ground to be able to absorb the water. And, and once they hit our house, they kept on going down the street uh, to other neighbors' houses and saving them literally tens of thousands of dollars for, you know, being able to remove all the stuff out and being those, you know, Im imperative extra hands to be able to help us out. Thank you. If I could jump in here, Chuck uh, touched on something I'd, I'd like to 
uh, bring up, and that is re-entry into the neighborhoods. Um, Chuck, they didn't just miraculously show up at your house, we directed them. And as the volunteer <laughs> group actually contact the borough and they say, we wanna come and help. And we put our heads together and say, who, do, who needs to help, where can we send them? And that's what we do. Um, for those who have not gone through a flood, um, we learned a big lesson in 2004, and that is the human experience. Um, people are, there's a lot of not good people out there and people were showing up. Uh, just imagine you've taken all your belongings out of your house and put them out in your front yard to dry and you're trying to figure out what you're going to uh, be able to save and what you can save. And somebody just comes up and picks up and puts it in a truck and drives away. That was happening quite often. So we learned a big lesson in 2004. So when the 2005 flood came along, and I, I don't take credit for thinking of this, um, it does belong, the credit does go to somebody from Rivermore, I won't mention his name, but um, we instituted the wristband policy. And basically we shut down all the bridges. And if you want to get in, you have to prove that you're a resident. We check your ID, we take a list, you know, we write your name down, your address in case, make sure you're safe when you go in there. Um, we give you a wristband and residents might get a blue wristband and a contractor pulls up and he said he wants to go in. Okay, we're not letting contractors in unless they can prove that they actually have a customer in the, in the neighborhood, in the, in the affected area. So they're not cold calling, they're not knocking on doors, they're not taking people's property off the front yard and they would get a yellow band. Now, what we typically do is we let the residents keep the blue band, but the contractor bands would get changed every day. That way we know everybody's on the up and up. So we, we modify that as we need to, um, but that is a plan that we, we didn't really need it too much in 2011. Um, the good thing is, is that due to the amount of houses elevated in Rivermore, the impact was lessened. It was still a major flood if your house was not elevated, but the majority of houses were elevated. Had that flood happened in the flats, it would have been catastrophic and we would have had myriads of problems and we would have run out of wristbands, but we're prepared for this and there is a methodology and we don't reopen the neighborhoods until it is safe to let people in there. We're not gonna come in and be big brother, but we have to be able to get an ambulance in there should someone get hurt and we need to get a fire truck in there should something happen. So we have to inspect the roads, we have to clean, you know, get, at least get the top layer of mud off, make sure the, the roadway is actually still present make sure it's not obstructed by debris. Um, if you ever want to see him swing by for a hall, I'll show you pictures from the January 96 flash flood when the ice boulders the size of cars were on River Road. Uh, we actually had to clear River Road with a backhoe, uh, multiple backhoes. So th there is a plan. Um, it's not just everybody gets in. And yes, I know at one point the Mary Yardley Bridge um, was the back way in. I myself used it, um, but that's not an option anymore. We have to keep it safe for everybody. So I hope that gives you a little background on how you get back in. Um, when you do leave, if you are evacuated, know how to contact everyone, have a meeting place, because you are going to get separated. It's much easier now than it was 20 years ago with the cell phone technology. But you know, think about these things in advance. You know, do you want to meet uptown somewhere? Are you going to go to the uh, the Holiday Inn or whatever? But these are things you, you want to think about. And go to the borough website. There's a wealth of information on there. And if you need an answer that's not there, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, Wes. Okay. Um, any other questions before we end this meeting? And like I said, if you do have a question that didn't get answered, do feel free to email us and we will get back to you. I'd like to personally thank everybody for, uh, you know, putting this together. I, I wish I had part, been able to participate in the other ones, but um, I, I know that I've actually, every time we have a high water event, we all learn something new. Um, and, and I know that, uh, you know, unfortunately, as they say, the, you know, proper prior planning prevent piss poor performance, but, you know, we've had a lot of proper, uh, proper opportunities and, and, uh, have, have come up with some really good things. And, and, uh, I'm very happy that, that the state and FEMA have been able to use Yardley Borough as 
a model in some cases to be able to uh, help share information that we've gone through and, and, and you know, gained uh, in other areas to help others. Thank, thank you, Mr. Dolan. Okay, well, um, I think we've uh, taken a lot of people's time and I actually learned a lot this evening. So thank you to uh, Don, Dan, uh, Chuck, Carl mm -hmm. and Wes. And uh, thank you for all the helpful information. And uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to email us. And uh, thank you and have a good evening. You too. All right, good night. Have a great night, folks. Take care.